We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Welcome back to O'Reilly Radio. This is episode 168B, where we're going to talk to a firearms instructor. Bill's going to take us to school. This is, a, this is a, uh, recorded Friday, October 20th, 2017. Dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your Stan Cowan. We've got Daniel Atson, we've got Fred Sims, and William Joyner. I'm just going to call you Bill because that's all I ever used to call you back in high school. Pretty much. You're one of the few that have. Everybody for the last 20 years has called me Joyner. Well, that's because military. I'm just in the military. Yeah. <laughs> that's just how that like works. Even, even my friends. Mostly join. Huh. Well, I'm so just going to call you Bill. <laughs> no, no, you, can call me, you can call me Bill. I go by so many names these days. Hey, you, officer joiner. Hey. Hey, all, down, staff all works. Yeah, pick one. It's all good. I answer gotcha. them all. Okay. Well, we also answered a feedback. So if, uh, if our listeners and viewers out there happen to have anything that they'd wish to chime in on, which I imagine we probably will, go ahead and email them in at oreallyradiopodcast at gmail.com or phone them in at 470-222-6759. Or feel free to troll us on our YouTube channel and leave whatever you want on this. I'll probably ignore most of them. And also a big thank you to our Patreon supporters, Don Davis, Melissa G., Henry, and Daniel Duncan of the Problematic Podcast. So I asked Bill <clears throat> on the last show that we recorded, would you be interested in coming on my podcast and discussing weapons and, and home defense? And Bill says, is this to be yes. an actual discussion or more of an all gun owners are evil Nazi racist and deserve to be shot kind of thing? I assured you that it was not that. <laughs> That we're going to be as rational as possible. So, Thanks. William Joyner is many things. A U.S. Marine who has been active in firearms instruction and physical security for the last 20 years. Founder and chief instructor of Interitus. Did I pronounce that, pronounce yeah. that correctly? Mobile yes, firearms. Most people go Interitus. That's wrong. No, okay. So, Interitus. Mobile Firearms Training of San Antonio, Texas. And Teridus focuses on providing high-quality training, education, and consulting services for individuals, families, and businesses who want their training on their schedule. And Teridus will send an NRA certified instructor, I believe that's you, to your home or office with a training plan tailored to your schedule and will conduct shooting portions at a convenient range. They offer Texas Carry License, School Safety, Counteractive Shooter, NRA approved training, customized pistol and shotgun, fitting, purchase, concealment consultation. William Joyner is also a longtime friend of mine from high school, as we kind of unveiled earlier. So, <laughs> you are many things, uh, and father is one of them as well. And, yes. you know, you're just, gosh darn it, a nice fella. I try. No, you don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can ask some, you can ask some of the people that I guard. You know, no? 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 Okay, well. <laughs> All right, so uh, before, we get, before we really get into it, um, I just wanted to, should we lay out some definitions, like what a mass shooting is? Well, we can, but there are so many different definitions out there. You've got some of the news that they come in with, hey, two people were shot. That's a mass shooting. The FBI definition, I think, is... Four people have to die. Yeah. To be a match. There you go. I think it's not death. I think four people uh, in a combination of uh, dead or injured. Uh, okay, the, def is. the definition I pulled was a mass shooting is an incident involving multiple victims of firearms related violence. Another official, unofficial definition of a mass shooting is an event involving the shooting, not necessarily resulting in death, of four or more people with no cooling off period. Yeah, similar to the Antioch shooting that happened in Tennessee a few weeks ago. Yeah, there's uh, there's been so far this oh, year. Some sense. Yeah, so so far this year, uh, at least according to the gun violence archive, there have been 284 mass shootings in 2017. A lot of those are right at that cusp of four four people. Um, yeah. and we've had a rise uh, in. 2016, it was 357. In 2015, 332. In 2014, 272. So this seems to be something that is uh, gaining popularity. Uh, I uh, guess. Yeah. No, we, we, you know, we, we have, if you, if you isolate with just, for just guns, probably. 
mass killings have been going on for how long now? I mean, you start at Wounded Knee for America, I guess, and come up. I mean, if you really want to go back into it, I want to say 17, 1779, there was a schoolhouse bombing in Bath, Michigan. It's Bath. I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Yeah, that's. Yeah, you know, we can go. We can go numbers all day long and make numbers pretty much say whatever we want. And for that, I'd say, don't come to me. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm a marine. Feed me crayons. We're good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. Well, okay. So <clears throat> considering that, uh, that we are mostly leftists here, you know, and yeah. not necessarily wanting to take firearms away, but, uh, we are those people that actually bandy about the term, uh, you know, reasonable gun control laws and things like that. Uh, I've read some of your blogs and I believe that oh, you scoff. God. I believe you scoff at that uh, that particular sentiment. Uh, well, several times. Reasonable gun control is another one of those elastic terms. So one person, reasonable gun control is nobody has them except for police and the military. And even then, eh, let's think about the cops and the military. Uh, other people believe reasonable gun control is using both hands. Um, there and everything in between the yeah. blog by intent is at least i try i'm not the greatest writer sarcastic and it's intended to be an experiment in corpse flower marketing as well uh, I, I see want, yeah i want somebody to come out and go oh my god look what this guy says and then hopefully throw some some of my reasoning behind guns in there maybe four or five paragraphs down it might not work on them but maybe if I can get one person to think, as opposed to just, you know, parroting some kind of line from either either side of the board, really, or either side of the tracks, NRA, every town for gun safety, uh, was it? Oh, it, it, the lesser the lesser miles. Yeah, 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 down both sides. Really. Yeah. The NRA is the better funded of those organizations, however, by a long they are, mile. I have so. five million members. They they. Yeah, I'd probably get a few bucks. I, I am an NRA member. I'm an NRA life member. I couldn't turn down the deal. They said, hey, you're a disabled veteran. I'm like, yes. I'm like, well, it's like 200 bucks for life. I'm like, I'll take it. Yeah, that is a pretty good deal. I'd probably jump at that, too. So just, you know. Yeah, just a bit. A couple of free magazines. Yeah, we're good with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you've at least gotten your money's value out of that. And then oh, some, yeah. probably. So. Do you have the ability to join the wine club? Because there's an NRA wine club. Because nothing quite goes together. What, really? Yes. I, my, no, my, yeah, my boss, sure who is an NRA member, and since oh. I control the mail that comes in and out of the office, He's, I happened to uh, get his flyer for the NRA wine club yeah. today. And I wine was like, is a very popular thing. I'm, I'm not a big fan. I thought about getting it for the wife, but we mostly brew and drink the beer here. I mean, it just adds a whole new term to, like, shotgunning. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> <clears throat> It does. Have you seen the uh, o the uh, range in Oklahoma that has a bar? In it? No, but this doesn't surprise well, me. We have we. Ha I mean, we have it similar things here. There's a, a place called. Um, uh, fr uh, I'd have to look it up. I, I want to say Frog. Um, let me look it up. But we do have a place here that is a restaurant, a bar, and a gun range. So you you know you can yeah. eat, you can get your it, drinks. It's Florida. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Oh. Florida is its own unique beast. It is. Uh, it some is. days I refer to it as Texas Light. Other days, again, we have, there's the Twitter feed, Florida Man, you don't see Texas. Man. No, but you should. Because no, the, should. the last should. time I drove through Texas, I saw the funniest thing, and it was a drive through daiquiri stand. Yes. Yes, those are different. Um, they They're legal as long as you leave the paper on the straw. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 you don't really find those in the cities, though. You usually find them... In between the cities. <laughs> yeah, in between, yeah, exactly. In between the cities. And those are that, that is a space of hours of long, straight road. Yeah, it is, but wow. A lot of, a lot of it, you know, well, a lot of it, their intention is, you know, it's the beer barn. They want the rancher to come in once a month, load the truck up, and take all his alcohol for the month out. Hopefully, one day, maybe I'll be one of those guys. <laughs> maybe not quite that much alcohol. I... Again, I brew my own. It's much easier. I'm getting better at it. It's drinkable. Well, that's good. That's actually the tagline. Join our brunch. It's drinkable. Okay. That's better. Than that. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, 
uh, the whole point of that of that um, scree there was, what would you, what would you really tell us? You know, you've you've now got a bully pulpit here. So, what do you got and for us? Take us to school, sir. Well, there's there's really not a whole lot of schooling to happen. Um, my big thing is. I like my right to keep and bear arms. I'm a responsible citizen, and in my company, in my business, and in my daily life, as both a trainer and as a, as a security guard, when I'm not busy teaching people, safety and correct usage of all things is my thing. I mean, if it wouldn't come off quite so bad, I've got. I don't know if you remember Andy, but the when I you know showed up for Big Dave's funeral, you know the the, the, the Pentagon on the one arm, I considered once Zuckerheit's Nazi down the other but nobody knows what that means they just see nazi shaven headed blue eyes and go yeah yeah we're gonna put him in jail like, no. safety nazi not a good thing too um <laughs> when it comes to guns yeah no. I, I teach i teach a lot of license to carry for my for my company our bread and butter is mostly uh basic shooting which i love it when people come to te- come to that first but we're dealing with a, a skills and knowledge gap i'm seeing from probably the late 60s on through the mid 90s of people just weren't raised with guns in the house um daddy didn't teach him to shoot and the ones that are coming to me that have had hands on a firearm before if they're not for if they're not military or former military then i get a lot of well my daddy did teach me to shoot and consequently we get what we get what we call the 870 pattern on the target which is remington 870 pattern it's just all over the place ah okay and I want to teach people to be better, to be responsible. When you come to my class, you get a heavy, well, by law, especially in the license to carry course, you get a heavy dose of law. That's pretty much all it is. The first two hours alone is use of force and deadly force. And they get a big disclaimer at the beginning of the course. This class does not qualify you in my eyes to carry a handgun. But it does qualify you in the eyes of the state to believe that people are responsible and we'll go out and seek more training. They don't come and get it from me sometimes, though, because, well, I'm expensive. Uh, that whole mobile thing is is pricey. You pay for convenience. Yeah. But at the same time, there's not a whole lot of guys running you know, active shooter courses every weekend. There's not a whole lot of guys running you know, when you should and should not shoot courses every weekend. So I try to pack what I can into my, into my state-mandated time. Um, How many uh, hours is it? How many... For for the for the state mandated for now this is specifically for Texas because every state does it yes. differently. Correct. So Correct. Texas state mandates minimum four hours, maximum six hours. If I've got a smart student, I can get through the law in about five hours because surprisingly the law is very simple. Um, it's all the case law that's going to trip you up if you get if you go to court. So my ultimate philosophy on all this is if you're regardless of what the law says if you're not protecting life why are you pulling the gun but the, see that sounds good. reasonable it is I try, I try to be and it should be um, but you've got so many people they weren't raised by former marines who are like well why are we shooting at this guy when he's a threat okay they're raised, they're, they're raised by movies and tv and you know hey you're angry shoot the guy if he's the quote bad guy shoot the guy now, guns are, I, I want people to look at firearms as a tool in the box, not the only tool in the box. And we have so many more options out there. You don't need to take a life. Not sure what else. I can, that's about all I have to say about it. <laughs> well, th- thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gump. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I had a couple questions from one of our other uh, correspondents that was not able to join. Um and he wanted to know what the best weapons were for home defense. Ooh. Oh, my. If you want to set off the biggest or one of the biggest arguments in a gun group. <laughs> ask that. I knew that that was going to be one of those uh, vitriolic topics. But in your yeah, in, in your opinion. Ooh. For untrained. I guess so. Yeah. Okay. okay. Say you live in my house. I have a. I have a very nice long hallway with most likely points of ingress for anyone criminal a, a decent amount of distance away, which means that ideally 
I would use my, you know, my alarms go off. I have a spot right outside my bedroom door that is perfect for should somebody decide instead of having taking the TV, which they're more than welcome to take, please take the TV. If they decide to come up the hallway towards where my people are, where my armory is, then the shotgun would be the way to go. I don't have to have a good beat on the individual. My first round isn't going to necessarily do lethal damage. I, I don't. It's not just straight up gear slugs. It's one round of bird shot, one round of buck, and then gear slugs because my hallway ain't that long. I'm not rich. But my intention is to dissuade the individual from continuing down my hallway and to exit out of whatever door he chooses. Uh, with my TV, with my Xbox, with the computer, all that. Well, please don't take the computer. Take the Xbox. Um, <laughs> I don't need the computer. For this. Um, but that said, um, that's that's specific for my kind of house. If you have a short, you know, the, the long hallway gives the shot an opportunity to spread, which reduces the individual, you know, the the mass attempting to go into the person at any one point. I mean, I don't know if you recall a few years ago, Dick Cheney shot an 80-year-old in the face out bird hunting. Yes. The, I mean, and now granted, he shot a lawyer, so there are some things to be said about that, but the lawyer survived. The bird shot can be lethal if you mitigate, you know, certain certain bits about it, not so much. Okay? That's, that's the chance of this way. After that, I have a round of buckshot. Nine ball, thirty-eight caliber, nine thirty-eight caliber balls, and they'll head down the hallway too. Again, the point of the hallway in the distance is one to give them a chance to think, to give them a chance to get out, but also to give a chance for that shot to spread out. After that, no, I'm sorry, you're if you're still coming after that, uh, dear slugs. By that point, they're going to be close enough. I might very well be engaging in. Uh, Hand to hand. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody get uh, hit with the back end of a rifle, but it ain't pretty. Um, no, it's uh, similar to a Louisville mm-hmm. Slugger, but uh, a little more pointed. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, kind of, yeah. But that's, again, that's for my kind of place. That's one of the things we do for our consultation is we're going to come to your house and we're going to see what you've got and I'm going to tell you how best to employ it in a defensive mode. Something I don't want people out here doing is they hear that alarm go off. And now all of a sudden they think they're a SWAT team. That's not the point of this. It's not the point of having a gun. And even if you are a SWAT operator, clearing an entire house by yourself, or even with one other person, is a pain in the cookies. And what I want my people to do is to have an easily defensible point where all their people are secure. Let them take you. You've got insurance. It's what homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance is for. If they come down, they, you've got your, at the same time, I guess it's best to say, you've got your red line. Okay? After this point, this is no longer simply a threat to my possessions, this is a threat to my life. Can you get out of the windows? Maybe. It's very possible you can. If so, why haven't you left? Mm-hmm. What do you do when you've got small children? What do you do when you have guests who haven't been framed to get out of the house properly? Okay? My, when I've had a two-story house, well, it's kind of a pain to get out of that sometimes. It's all situationally dependent. Right? If all you've got is a handgun, I'll show you where you should be to maximize the use of whatever available cover you have in your house, should they be armed as well. And I try to make it a big point up front. Guys, just because you've got a gun doesn't mean you're going to win this. Okay? It's, a, again, another tool in the box. Okay? You should have already called 911. You should be yelling at this guy to get out. You shouldn't just be sitting there quietly waiting. Yeah, that's now, all. That you, almost uh, ends up being entrapment at that point. Well, I don't know about that. Again, yeah. I'm not a lawyer. It's not so much an entrapment, but I mean, there are, there can be rather uh, some tactical reasons for staying. I mean, they're already in your house mm-hmm. in most states, including Florida, and even sometimes in California. Okay, you're in the house. You're presumed to have malintent towards the occupants. Right. And, and frankly, in Texas, I, I again, I was watching, uh, scrolling through Netflix, and I came across a segment of Joe Rogan. He's like, why would you rob a house in Texas? No, yes. <laughs> yeah, there is that. But usually and, people that are people that are robbing, they have, there's reasoning behind the choices yeah. that people make. And oh, yeah. the the reasoning that these people go through 
is not typically the reasoning that you or I or reasonable people would have. So they're already making an unreasonable choice. What's to say they haven't made 10 others in the process of getting there? Well, generally, that's how they got to where they are. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's sad, but at some point, if, if it comes down to them or me, I'd much rather it be them. Right? It's, it's a sad thing to have to say. It's sad that this world has come to that. But the alternative is sitting in, you know, who knows, maybe my alarm goes off while I'm in my bathroom. There are, there are no exits from my bathrooms. Right? So now what do I do? Hopefully, I, I at least get out to it one of the guns, but because I'm, I'm not taking a gun in the bathroom. That's, that's, there's paranoid, and then there's that. Well, I'm glad that you've drawn lines for yourself. That's good. And, and everybody should. Everybody yeah. Everybody should have their line. You know, some people are willing to turn the other cheek and be beaten. There was an incident in Chicago, I want to say, two years ago, where an ex-boyfriend broke into the, broke into the girl's apartment while she was just there hanging out with her new man. And he proceeded to beat her unconscious. Uh, all the while, she was screaming at the other guy in the house who had, amazingly, a, a Chicago valid Illinois permit to carry uh, to not shoot the guy. Okay, that's her choice. It's perfectly, feasible, perfectly valid. Um, I'm not saying everybody needs to go out shooting everybody. That's stupid. But if you want to, if you want effective tools for self-defense, that should be an available tool. I'm going to run down on that. Well, so, okay, so, well, we, we can, I think we can all agree that having a reasonable use case for a weapon like that, you know, we're reasonable people, therefore having a reasonable excuse makes sense. Mm-hmm. And yeah. self-defense is certainly one of those. But at, at what point... Are we simply being paranoid? You know, because well, ba- back in our parents' day and our grandparents' day, locks were not necessarily locked all the time. Was the world a safer place then than it is now? No. Arguably, no, it was not. No. So are we just now a, a culture that's scared? Sometimes. Maybe uh, that's that leads up to an individual's choice to purchase a firearm, or their choice to carry a firearm, their choice to open carry, their choice to carry a long gun. But if they're being made, if they're being made afraid by everything in their environment, even if it's an artificial fear, is that really a choice anymore? Because they're being coerced by everything to be scared. No, hmm. yeah, that's. That's a good point. And I wish I had good answers. Um, I know why I carry. I carry because, again, it's another tool for me to have. You, you, know, also, have, you also have exceptional training. I do. And I try to give other people that exceptional training. You know, come to Interitus, we'll give you some exceptional training. Absolutely. Well, well, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid all the plugs. No, no, no. That's fine. You can plug, plug as much as you like. That's one of the reasons to come on a show for the love of God. So, <clears throat> um, I know. Um, so I have exceptional training, but you don't necessarily need all the high speed, low drag, and on, 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 even the you know, stuff I've done before is not the highest of high speed or the lowest of low drag. You know? A good fundamental understanding of use of force, good fundamental understanding of the escalation of nonviolence is really what most people need. A big one, situational awareness. Pull your head out of your phone and look around you. That alone will solve 75, 80% of your problems. You know, just, you know the yeah. criminals that are out there, at least the ones you know, down in some of the places that I've had to go and teach or some of the places I've been assigned as a guard, um, they're, looking for, they're not looking for a fight. They're looking for that easy score. And I don't have to pull out the I don't have to even show it. It's not needed. Just your presence alone is the deterrent. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You, you mentioned probably the most valuable thing ever, and that was de-escalation. Mm-hmm. Now, this is where I'd like Fred to chime in, because Fred, you, you um, 
Go over your your history with law enforcement, because I know that you've probably had some de-escalation training as well. Um, yeah, so obviously not the extensive background that uh, Bill has or anything, but I did. I, I was a correctional deputy with Brevard County for two and a half years, so I went through their training course, um, you know, 400 hours through FDLE, uh, 480 um you know, so when you go through that, there's plenty of things that you have to do um, in terms of, you know, obviously our firearms course was much longer than the one that you have to teach just for, you know, requirements. So, you know, everything that you're talking about are things that I did, but drawn out over weeks, you know, so uh, I definitely have, um, you know, experience with that. And then in terms of, you know, the uh, interpersonal skills, you go through a class, but until you're actually in the situation you don't develop those skills until you're there until you're talking with the people that you're going to have to de-escalate so I, I get where you're coming from in terms of people need that skill but it's also a skill that's really hard to just learn you know you you have to actively be engaged in a, a situation that requires de-escalation because otherwise you're just putting into practice things you read in a book and what works for Bill when he's angry is not going to work be what works for Andy when he's angry. And so what I learned in that book is only going to get me to a point where if it does not work for this particular person, I'm getting decked or worse. You know, so it's right. definitely an experience based from what I've learned and from what I've implemented. It is an experience based thing that you it, it's great to have a basis of to, to learn in a class or, or, or have that. But you really need to to it's something you need to hone all the time, you know, where you need to be in those situations. And when you start to feel, especially yourself getting amped up, you know, that's when you need to make the conscious choice to like, okay, hold on. I need, I need to step back. Maybe this whole situation needs to step back and see where we're at. And sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes you have to deescalate yourself. It, yes. Yeah. Very that's, much so. That's you, very important. Oh yes, definitely. In the, in the civilian, in the civilian world, like, you know, you know, as, as a deputy, you know, your job was to run towards the problem, you know, no matter what it was. If you were working in the, in the jail or over in the county facility, which, weird, you might have met my mom. Um, when did you get out as a Brevard, as a Brevard County officer, a Brevard County Corrections officer? Uh, I was there from 2007 to 2010, so. Yeah, my mom works in the parole office. Anyway, uh, you guys have to run towards it. What I try really hard to get through to people is, you know, first stage of de-escalation in the civilian world is avoid the problem to begin with. Somebody's shouting, somebody's coming at you. Turn around, leave, get out of the way, go someplace public, go someplace well lighted. If you can get away from it, why not? If somebody's gonna, you know, if somebody else wants to pull your man car, have them call me and I will set them straight. There's no, there's. In, civ in civilian life, in standard day-to-day, -day, going, going to work, going home, maybe going out to a party with your friends, life, there's no necessary need to engage with a problem. You can avoid it. You can call the police. These are perfectly acceptable answers. And I don't, I don't want my students out there trying to talk down, you know, Jim Bob or whoever with a shotgun uh, from taking out the party. I, Rather, they say, hey, guys, Jim Bob went home to get his gun. Maybe we should all be allowed to. We should have a deputy to get something. Uh, there's, there's levels of de-escalation. Yeah, 400 hours, or even 400 hours, as you said, you know, until you get out into the situation, uh, you, you still don't know how you're doing. That's why you have your field training officer for how long? How long? Six months? A year? Um, well, when we were there, I think we were FTO for, th I want to say three months, but then even after that, I mean, it's not like you're on your own. You're still, um, once you go through all the areas and you learn, you know, uh, the, the different uh, pods you're going to be working and the different uh, jobs that you're going to have to do, you're still right. always in a group. And generally speaking, you're not going to have four newer uh, deputies working the same area so you're even though you're not with an FTO anymore you are still with a corporal and you are with uh, you know experienced officers who have been there for a while at, at that point that's where you're going to be learning from you you've transferred over from having the direct training officer to now 
watch these guys, they've been doing it. Yeah. And I think this also, again, identifies a major knowledge gap in, in life, not just in guns or self-defense training, but I didn't really receive anything remotely approaching what I would consider de-escalation training at any point in time during my illustrious floor career as a student in the Florida public school system. Yeah, and, that never really came up, did it? No, yeah. it should. Because, I mean, how many fights were at school every day? Yeah, one here and there. Well, there's yeah. yeah, there's there's that. But you know, it something that occurs to me, especially with the the age of um, populism and white supremacy coming back in, and you know, really, really coming to the fore. The trolls are no longer on Twitter. They're, of course, they never really were. They were always out there. They were always a you know readily available. Just now, they feel that they don't need to hide behind the anonymity, and they can do it in face to face. I think that we can probably try, or at least maybe in, at least endeavor to, practice the de-escalation there, in the Twitterverse, yeah. on the YouTube comments. You know, the, that's where all the vitriol really is. I mean, it's a horrible, it's a, you know, just a, a den of villainy and scum. That, so Yeah, that Twitter, most easily for electronics. It is. It is exactly Moss Eisley Cantina. Um, just without and, music and, and maybe, you know, odd aliens. Well, no, no, the aliens are probably there. So, just as a, as a takeaway, de-escalation training, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an environment for that. And I think the Twitterverse and, and the YouTube comments section, and often a lot of comments on, on Facebook, you know, there's plenty of places where you can try to talk people down. Yeah, column de-escalation doesn't get retweets. Column de-escalation doesn't get uh, shares and likes. It's not the you corpse know, flower oh. marketing, right? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just it's, to bring that back nice around to back to you, yeah. It's, it's okay. No, it's, it's not really working, but you know, it does also give me a chance to you know, maybe vent a little bit, but without too much. I haven't been able to write. For too well, it... it just you, your statement of that, the corpse flower marketing, that really resonates with me that that's so much of what I see. Just, uh, it's I, like, I, I, how, how genuine is that comment? Or is it meant just to inflame and get people to, to say something? Probably. It's a BuzzFeed headline, you know, in, in many ways. So corpse flower marketing. I, I don't know if you coined that, but I'm giving it to you now, right. and I'm I'm going to Thank use you. it everywhere yeah. else. I'm pretty sure I did because you know you catch more more you know some say you catch more flies with honey than you do with, with vinegar, but you catch many more with the scent of a dead body. Just like the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Thank you, Bill. And that's <laughs> that. Thank you. That's kind of what I I know. So let me get a little about another five hours of no sleep, and then I get really funny. Um, Maybe so next week. Beyond that, though, and I just look like I'm dead. Uh, find me on Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to, you don't want to be the corpse flower. That's the thing. No, no, no. no. Never be the corpse flower. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, see. I, so, other um, other questions. You know, to get to get back to that. Um, you you had mentioned that you have an armory. Now, as a firearms sure. instruction instructor, I understand that you would have an arm, armory. I I don't think that Jim Bob needs to have an armory. But it depends on what Jim Bob's doing with that armory. Well, assuming that he's not a firearm safety trainer. Okay. And assuming that if he's going hunting, he's going with maybe one other person that probably has their own gun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you got a hunting gun. Yeah. And you've got your home defense weapon, probably a shotgun. Because that seems to be the that that's kind of stuck in our head that you know that's a great home defense weapon a, a nice pump action shotgun or something like that. That uh, and and they are, but I can't really go walk. I mean, under Texas law, yes, I can go walking around with my with my shotgun slung over my shoulder, but it tends to scare people. Isn't that the point? Uh, As it should. No, no, it's, it's that's kind of not. The point. I don't want people to be afraid of. Well, you can also walk around in Texas now with a sword. You can. I think that's that's been made. That's been made legal. So, I mean, 
Hey, Texas. And part part of, part of that was to deal with the uh, cities like San Antonio. Um, so, uh, Texas state law used to say that you couldn't have any kind of a knife with a fixed blade over over five inches, and then you have the cities come in under that and say, "All right, we're going to ban fixed blade knives under five inches," which effectively resulted in a 100 percent you know fixed blade knife ban. Then you got these boys coming in from hunting wherever they've got the knife in their car or it's still on their, on their belt. I'm not saying it's an awesome thing, but they just want to go grab a soda out of the out of the stop and rob, and next thing you know, they're getting hemmed up by the cops because oh hey, that's a four and a half inch skinning knife you got on your belt. That's illegal here in the city of San Antonio. It it stops the piecemeal legislation for and against, and it kind of makes it easier. I mean. It's, State side, state level laws, those are easy to handle. I've done you know, trips all around the country. I did a motorcycle tour of the more or less the East Coast. Sorry, I didn't stop by my last time. I decided to stop and see my grandma, and we had a couple hours, and then I had to get back on the road. No problem. Um, yeah, but you know, every state, mm-hmm. I can stop at the state line and and you know double check my understanding of the laws. Make hey, if I if I got to change where my gun's at or how it's stored, so be it. I went up the, I can't remember all the little highways, I basically drove up the Appalachian Mountains north all the mm. way into New York. It means, you know, I'm coming up through Georgia, seeing all those places, and yeah, they're fine with whatever. Uh, but then I hit, the, I hit the state line for that little 50-mile section of uh, Maryland in between West Virginia and Pennsylvania. You got to stop, take your gun out, unload it, lock the ammunition up, lock the gun up, ride 50 miles, stop, Got out, put it all back together, and then continue on my journey. Oh wait, no, I entered New York State. Now I got to fix it. And it's it, while I while it sounds like I'm I'm kind of irritated, I am, but it's I can deal with it. If I had to stop every time I pass through a different township, just because the mayor doesn't like guns, or as we had in Bear County until we had the election, the uh, the sheriff doesn't like certain kinds of guns then that's a bit much. I think state level controls are not. Which I know I got kind of off topic. So. Well, it's it's off topic, but it's an interesting topic and one that we, we go back and forth on um, often. We, we tangent into states' rights and whether or not it's like, wouldn't it just make better sense if we, as the United oh. States of America, had one set of laws? But no, we have states' laws and they have to exert some control, but then they complicate everything for everyone they do especially with all that interstate commerce stuff right but i it's it's also the incubator of new ideas new that's like hey let's try this out in one place let's try something let's try the opposite in another state sometimes we can see what works sometimes we can't although it seems it does seem to me lately that just politically in general uh, we've answered all the easy questions i think we've pretty much got those more or less hashed out hmm like, We've I, answered I, I, all the easy questions. I That's, don't think so because there are some people one. trying some really dumb stuff. Well, there will always be people trying dumb stuff. Yes, but when you have an entire state try a, a an experiment that any economist could say this doesn't work, the math yes. doesn't add up, and then do that, and now we're trying to try it at the federal level after having a case study that proves. This don't work. Are you talking about uh, Kansas? Thank you. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. I I, I get you. And oh, those people are the brightest. Spe- and apparently, Spy- those people get elected. Well, yeah, speaking I mean, speaking <laughs> of brightest, uh, nearly half the country um, believes that you know don't, does not believe in evolution anymore. Yeah. How? And some of them would, you know, just be perfectly happy with the Earth being the center of the solar system, everything revolving around it. Flat no, earthers no, 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 no. are on the rise. Those guys. Yes. I, yeah. I, I worked, uh, I got called over for basically to earn some beer money guarding one of our taller structures here in San Antonio, and I was up on the observation level, and I met a guy trying to convince his, his girlfriend that the Earth was flat. He goes, "Hey, look, see, the uh, horizon doesn't change." And I was like, the problem being, of course, I was on duty, and when he asked me, "Hey, what do you think about this flat Earth theory?" before I could even stop myself, I was like, "Total bullshit!" I'm like, "Ah." Oh. 
It's like, oh wait, I'm not supposed the to say anything. Answer, yeah, the correct answer should have been, uh, sir, I don't really need a basketball. But after that, it was just back in my mind. Was, Somebody get me a basketball and a ruler. Let me, let me educate you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alas, no, no basketball or ruler was to be had. So I just kind of went to the elevator back down to the bottom. Stayed there until we left. He wasn't a threat so much as just kind of a truth. Not an immediate threat. No. No, that's that's true. And that's He's an existential threat. <laughs> he is. <and> <laughs> evidence <laughs> of an existential threat. Evidence of an existential threat. Nice. So, yeah. as I was referring to Jim Bob and his home defense strategy and his arsenal, um, right. how many weapons should the average person, if they are concerned with home defense and they wish to make an investment, they say have a three-bedroom, two-bath two house? They can afford it. They can afford a three-bedroom, two-bath house. A couple of hunting rifles, maybe an AR for linking. If you're a prepper, maybe two. Um, although honestly, I think a 22 might be a better one than that. Uh, for home defense? Well, no, no, that's, that's, that covers everything. Hunting, hogging, um, that's, that, those are two different things here in Texas. You can go hunting and for that you're required to have uh, a rifle that holds no more than three rounds. Uh, for hogging, honestly, at this, at this stage, they're all vermin. So the, the state, I think, would be happy if you pulled out a minigun, but... Yeah, they're, they're really bad favorite. for that one. Uh, well, no, we can get them here. Oh, we can have them in Texas. I did not know. Well, you, you can have you can have full auto weapons in all most you know, not all fifty states, but most of them. And if they don't specifically ban them, you just got to follow the federal laws. And they all get all yeah. the paperwork. Yeah, there's paperwork the, involved in that. Yeah. Oh my goodness, boy, there's so much. Well, yeah. Machine guns, pressers. You know, it's just it's a pain. Um, but it also depends on what they want to do. I mean, I know guy. I've had clients come to me and say, yeah, I've had this, you know, it's a family heirloom, and I just want to go out and shoot it a little bit. Okay, one gun is good for them. Um, what about if you're an investor? You know, aside from I heard some of you, I caught some of your thing earlier about, you know, palladium being, you know, back on the, you know, the precious metals market, and I was kind of wondering why it wasn't before. Um, oh, yeah, I think it always was, but it's one of those yeah. that now it's in vogue again. Uh, uh, yeah, so. no, it's it's been used for for all sorts of things uh primarily rings it's come back into vogue and that's maybe why it's getting headlines because uh it's a nice alternative in the jewelry markets for silver uh and it's a middle ground for for rings um i don't believe it tarnishes either no it it does not tarnish it wears better than silver and it's less expensive than white gold um, so it's a nice middle ground. You know oh. more about palladium than I thought that you did. <laughs> uh, Certainly more than I do. Metallurgy is one of my many hobbies. Excellent. I like oh. to have a diverse yeah. crew. So Yeah, but there are people who invest in guns, hold their value very well. If you take care of your firearms, say you want to sell them when you're 90 and you can no longer deal with the recoil out of that tiny little 410, you got nobody to pass it on to? Sell it. It will make you a couple, a couple hundred bucks if, if it's a quality gun. I mean, same time if it's Raven Arms or some of the others that you can buy new for 150 bucks. No, there is a, there's a baseline of quality, and you do get what you pay for with guns. But I know collectors who their investments for these guns because they will accrue value, you know, or at the very least they'll hold their value. And that is a very different kind of gun owner. It than, is. than just it a is. I know. enthusiast. Those guys have massive armies, and like on the scale of Jay Leno's garage. Um, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, I mean, they take, they it's not an armory. armory. It's their portfolio. <laughs> yeah, it's a portfolio made of four-inch thick steel. But, wow. Hey, that's what they. Oh yeah, they, they, these guys are serious. It's Texas. Think about how much oil money is running. Right they have the money to buy the fun stuff. I went to a private shoot where we had a uh, we had one guy show up and he had he brought his M203 along. Okay? That's a grenade launcher. I and thought that that was yeah. That's classified as as a, as a destructive device by the ATF. And you can have one, but you better have all the permits and you better have the cash to buy it. I say what 2 3000 dollars for a cheap one. 
but then you also have to have the two hundred dollar tax stamp. You have to pay a thousand dollars or however much it is for each round, and that's if you want to go HEDP high explosive fuel purpose. Although most people don't even bother buying those because what's the point? You don't see anything. You buy the training rounds, maybe five hundred bucks. I don't know. I haven't priced them, and you still got to pay though two hundred dollars per round, just in tax. As much fun as it was to see that thing. Text two hundred dollars a round, okay? Because it's a, each one is an individual explosive device. Okay, so those yeah. now you're getting into the territory here. You're laying a groundwork for me. Sorry. No, no, no. You're, you're giving it's, us numbers. You're you're, you're laying yeah. the groundwork very nicely. Um, yeah, my, my numbers are, are out of thin air, guys. I, I don't have any. It, no, numbers. it's fine. No, no, I'm not going to use the numbers specifically against you. Just the fact that there are numbers. And I'm probably not going to really use it against you. It's just, I'm concerned with, we seem to have a real lack of regulation. Really? Yes. I, I, I see a lot of regulation involved. I want to buy a... that I'm buying the gun in. I think that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's, it's necessarily a bad thing, although, you know, if I want to go buy something in Colorado, having to have it shipped all the way back to Texas, fly back to Texas, get it, drive back to, or driver flies back to Colorado just to go hunting with that rifle, it's a bit much. I have a devilish, but, devilish question, though. Who would I, actually do that, though? Well, that's kind of the thing. No. Why... It, why do, I, why do I need to do that to go buy a hunting rifle, to go buy a shotgun? And I have to do that for all of that. I can understand where people may, you know, say things about like that about handguns. Handguns are used primarily for defense. Now, that said, I know plenty of guys who hunt with handguns. And they hunt large game with handguns. Revolvers, the bolt action. Yes, it's in a bolt action pistol. It's That's weird. a classic one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's just a lot of people take them and they make uh, they they make pistols that fire rifle. Guns. But there's also guys who go elk hunting with 44s. You know, the 454 Cassell or the 500 Smith and Wesson. But they may carry that same gun when they're back home in whatever state for their personal defense weapon. And frankly, the 500 Smith and Wesson that's a that's a beast. You know, for when you have a problem with that burglar behind your neighbor's fridge. Yeah, yeah, that's that's got some penetration power, I believe. Um, but if round. but if if you end up taxing somebody two hundred dollars a round for the high explosive, the dangerous category. Well, it's it's no, it's it, that's the flat tax. That's the tax for any NFA item is two hundred dollars. It's a flat any tax. Measure. Okay. Yeah. Well. Not quite a flat tax, like ten percent for any item, but yeah, two two hundred dollars. Whether it's a tiny little single shot pocket pocket shotgun, mm -hmm. maybe. Well, now that's that kind of a pistol. Uh, it gets kind of confusing once you really get deep into it. Of what's what counts as a destructive device, what counts as a shot, what counts as a pistol, what counts as a short barrel rifle, what counts as a short barrel shotgun, which is different than a short. -barrel. Are you familiar with the gun show loophole? The what? The gun show loophole. I, I know. I've, I've, heard the, I've heard the expression. I just, I, I'm at a gun show every month. I, I haven't found any loopholes with any of the dealers I work with. The gun show loophole isn't about dealers. It's about private sales. Oh, what's the difference between privately selling at a gun show and privately selling in the, the parking lot of a, a Walmart? There, there isn't. isn't really. There isn't any. The gun show loophole, gun law, uh, Brady law loophole, uh, private sale loophole, you know, all, all these things. Uh, it's all about the secondary market. And there is, this allows it to be done without any paperwork. True. True. And it's... Which makes it impossible to track who has anything. It That's makes it very possible. hard for law enforcement. It does. It does. Uh, there's a lot of laws that make things hard for law enforcement. Uh, about five years ago, there was a the South, state of South Carolina discovered they had a huge problem with people running their criminal enterprise from the prison. 
okay, via cell phone. The, the head of head of Department of Corrections or whatever the hell they were, it's been a while, uh, decided that the best way to fix this would basically be to build a big, you know, either put a jammer in or big Faraday cages in places. Okay, so you went with the jammer option, and federal law came immediately and put the kibosh on that because that was a violation of some council model, some esoteric law that I have no idea about. Um, it's FC, yeah, they're, it's they're, they're Federal FCC Communications law. Commission. Yeah. Yeah, the FCC came in and you know, they, they said, no, you can't do that. But I have criminals conducting criminal activity on smuggled and therefore illegal phones. Well, he, I, imagine, so the one, I imagine there was probably just other proper channels and a lot more paperwork that he probably had to file with the right people in order to get a jammer in place. Possibly. Because law enforcement also runs... Uh, uh, Dirt boxes, which are boxes that you know they they capture the the uh, you know cellular signal and rebroadcast it, but they act as a man in the middle attack, okay, and so they'll put box, about stingray. both, both. So yeah, that it depending on uh, on just which variety is being used, but they essentially have the same the same purposes, and they'll they'll bolt them on the bottom of a Cessna and just fly them over a town. And just, just pick up everybody, knock them all off the regular some, towers. That's probably a huge Fourth Amendment violation. Ah, uh, yep, it <laughs> sure is. <laughs> it's amongst other things, but but it's being but, done. Yeah, it's being done for law enforcement purposes. Right. And so they're not letting that Fourth Amendment necessarily get in the way, and then when they get found out, they get smacked down by the courts because they were violating an individual's right to have their cellular t- their reasonable expectation of privacy. That's it. Yeah, the reasonable expectation of privacy, which I hold very dear personally. I that's one of my yeah. favorite rights. <laughs> Says the man running the podcast, broadcast to everyone. <laughs> well, things said on here have no reasonable expectation of privacy whatsoever. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about picking and choosing exactly what you're saying. Like anything that I say on here, if it ended up on the news, I'd be fine with because I did say it in a public venue. I'm on the record. I'm recorded like four times. I'm streaming to several different locations all at once. You know, awesome. come on. Yeah. Well, Clearly, I'm, I'm, I'm on the record. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, and I get you. But you, so. you know, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, but the police are out there trying to catch bad guys. Right, but we also have... Yeah, but there's a right way and a wrong way to go about that endeavor, and it's one that we've been legislating for over 100 years. We, we are presumed innocent until proven guilty in this country. Unless you're a gunner. No, that uh, has nothing to do no, with it. No, that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but I, gun owners I, and are I, also I, presumed innocent until they start shooting at people. I, I have two <laughs> sticky questions. They, I will say they are loaded. Um, <laughs> do you have enough I bullet points know. on there? No. Uh, I have tons. <laughs> but... Okay, as a gun owner and instructor, um, we have certain standardized regulation for the owner, uh, ownership and operation of vehicles. Can we get at least the same amount of regulation for firearms? Or perhaps the requirement of insurance. Insurance would be great. Uh, you want having it that market. Yeah. What was that? I'm sorry. What you're okay. you're fading you in and out. The insurance market. I actually do want to collapse the insurance market. That'd be fantastic. Oh, well, then maybe we should go. Maybe maybe then it, gun owner insurance would be the way to go. But they would make money regardless. Oh God, it would make tons of money. And I carry yeah. a type of insurance. I don't. My guns are not insured. I am insured. Specifically, I'm insured against, well, actually, nothing. I'm more, let me rephrase it. not really insurance. It's distributed legal protection. I pay a certain amount per month, and my legal fees are paid. If I don't violate the law, I'll probably win my case, and they'll go after the guy that sues me or the family that sued uh, in, to recover their legal fees instead of taking it out of my black. But a reason, uh, you know, and I can, if we had, you know, gun owner education in schools like we have cars, I could almost kind of see a little more. A little more. Well, 
as someone who was in South Florida for their education, we didn't have education on on cars. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah, I will say we, we did have that at Merritt Island High. It, I believe it's gone now. They don't have that anymore. Yeah. Because um, uh, education spending has to get cut across the state. Across the nation, sir. Yeah. You're, you're thinking too small. <laughs> this is across the nation here. Um, I'm just going by all the stuff that where they've rerouted funds for education in the state that I know of. It's it's really bad. It's really, 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 really bad. We don't teach people to balance their own checkbooks, much less be able to make sure the safety's on a, on a gun. So it's it's gotten worse than since. I mean, and yeah, maybe that's something that needs to change. You know, maybe I'm you know, not necessarily an elective, but maybe you know one one time per year, starting at some predetermined grade level. We start doing just basic stuff. You don't get to shoot immediately, but maybe like, hey, this is a gun. Here's a two week. Here's two weeks of training. But then, maybe make that longer. Maybe make it, hey, here's a how to adult class. We kind of need well, that. I can see private yeah. enterprise stepping in like they have here with the the uh, car situation. I, for purposes of making things cheaper for my parents, when well, I don't came to Ensuring me for a vehicle, they put me through a driving course, which like made Germany. me far more comfortable to to operate a vehicle and gave them a break on their insurance. Um, I, and, and just thinking about it from a, okay, if we licensed guns and regulated guns as much as we regulate vehicles, okay, you have to have proof of competency with the firearm before you can own the firearm. You have to be insured. You have to have proof of insurance. We have a standardization with, with the licenses and a database. I think that's reasonable enough. Possibly. But if you're going to compare it to cars, um, you don't have to have any of that to have a car. You do. You do. I mean, you no, can't you operate the car without it. Ah, that's the difference. You can't go out in public with your car. Okay, so Without I would ask, your, what would be the like, point of owning the car slash the gun if your plan is not to operate it? Because you own here? your number yeah. of guns, do you plan on never operating them, or do you shoot them regularly when you go out and make sure that you're familiarized and you're doing your trainings and you expose people to them? I, I hear you, and I, I say if you want to compare this, Come to Texas. Come see all the ranch trucks. There's no there's no license plate on them. There's no insurance on them because they never leave the property. But it might be an idea, some kind of dedicated training for all Americans. Like, hey, you've now trained and licensed. And that's kind of how Texas is. You want to take your gun out in the public space. You've got to have that license. Well, let me rephrase it. You've got to have it for your hand. This is still Texas. You can walk around with your long arm in public down the street no harm no foul although you're probably going to get stopped by the cops at some point especially if you're of darker skin yeah i mean i yeah, think here in, here in san antonio they're going to stop you pretty much no matter who you are um as you get more towards the border maybe but we have other problems down in the border we have sinaloa we have the i have a couple of clients who are down south and their ranches extend hundreds of miles to the border and they routinely have problems, not so much with the large crowds of people that are crossing the land. It's the one or two. It's the guys that the crowd ostracized for whatever reason. They're maybe a little more desperate. Whatever the reason that whatever the reason was. And you know, the, the border's a weird place though. Come on down. It's it's strange now. Well the food's good. Oh God, the food's delicious. The food's good. He's not kind of lost any weight. <laughs> I mean, the food's good up here too. Oh. Yeah, but and and now we have a company called Favor that they'll bring you just about any food you want. Which I'm working twelve-hour shifts on a guard post. I'm like, hmm, I'd like Mediterranean. Send, and half an hour later, some dude shows up with my shawarma. It's awesome. Nice. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty sweet. We don't have that in all of Texas. Mostly in the bigger cities, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth. I'd expect it in Austin, absolutely. Oh, oh, the food's in Austin. 
<laughs> I do uh, like people Austin. Yeah. Weird. People are weird. Yes, well, they take they take pride in it. You know, it's keep Austin weird. That's the motto, I believe. Yeah, it's Austin, Portland, and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. They have street lights on their highways, like like legit a street light, and then you cross a highway. That's not normal. (laughs) Oh, you mean out in the out in the boonies in Texas, or somewhere? Is this somewhere in Austin? In Austin, that my aunt lives there, and when I I remember. The last time I was out there to visit her was shortly after I had become a licensed driver. And she was like, oh, do you want to drive around? You can drive me around. And they took me on the highway. And as we were driving on the highway, there was a street light. And so this was your going 75 to street light. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to drive in Austin ever because <laughs> my highway. A, was this 35 or one of the little littler highways I around? I don't know for sure. I couldn't tell you. I just remember we were on what was the equivalent to 95. Um, <laughs> and I, then I, there I, was a street light. And I that was like, nope, I'm good. I, I am not my experienced mind. enough for <sighs> this. There are Texas ranch roads that are the equivalent of 95. Nice, it's wide, it's paved. The roads here in places are so big that if somebody's behind you and they want to pass, you pull, you don't drop speed. You just pull over and they continue on. Yeah, that's the shoulder. The shoulder is gigantic. But uh, I have yeah. been up ninety five all the way up through Georgetown, and I haven't found a stoplight. Might have been one of. <laughs> Nonetheless, I stay out of Austin anyway, just because I hate the traffic. I can barely tolerate some yeah. of traffic. It's I'm it's been. Through. It's weird. It's weird out there. Um, Actually, my, other questions. Is it better to have a shotgun over a pistol or a pistol over a shotgun, and why? You only have one. Do I have one? You only have one. Wait, what, what, about a, what about a Smith & Wesson Governor? That's a, pist- that's a, that's a pistol that shoots a shotgun shot. around? It does. Uh, that was an anniversary. Sh- not a... Go ahead. Sure. Let, let, let's complicate <laughs> matters and throw that one in to the roulette of... <laughs> It's a 45 caliber revolver. Shoots 45 long, as they call it, long Colt 45 ACT. And but that you know the cylinder is so long, you can fit a 410 shot shell. It doesn't shoot a 12 gauge. It shoots a 410. It's not bad. Um, but I'm really not a big fan of revolvers for most defensive applications. Things like purse carry. Oh yes, definitely, because you don't have a reciprocating slide to get hung up in fabric. Okay. And again, that's a a last-minute kind of deal. You know, if you're shooting through your purse, your rapist, assailant, um, politician. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I like your list. You, up, you, know, and you don't necessarily need to aim to get them off of you. And again, that's the whole point of the gun. It's not there to kill them. It's there so they'll stop doing whatever it is that made you shoot them in the first place. What is your position on warning shots? Uh, no. Uh, the reason for this is twofold. Uh, it's tactical reason. One, if, you have to, if you're shooting a warning shot, you either A, you're going to continue to keep your eyes on the threat, which in for 90% of people in a threat situation, they're going to get a nice, heavy dose of tunnel vision. And all they're going to see is the threat, possibly only the threat's weapon, which means you have to then, for a warning shot, you are firing blind. You don't know where that bullet is going. And bullets, depending on the bullet, they can travel a mile, two miles, three uh, and if and it's up in, an, it falls in a ballistic arc and can kill an innocent person. Yeah. yeah, every 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 year we have a bunch of people that they love having, uh, they love their celebratory gunfire, and we had what one guy take one to the leg in Austin, strangely enough, because Austin's weird. Um, he took it in the leg and it hit his it nicked his femoral. I think he died on that. And so you're not looking where you're shooting. That's bad. Okay? Or if you're looking where you're shooting, you're taking your eye off. Threat, and that's also bad. A man with a knife can cross like 21 feet in three seconds. The tooler drill. Either way, it's it's a very short amount of time. Um, so, do you want to keep your eyes off the threat? Warning shots bad. If I, the gun should be the threat. Also, you yelling, get away, get away, and possibly backing up. You have no duty to here in the state of Texas, but. I say, hey, if you have a chance to retreat, do so. No, this isn't combat. Get out of there. So, okay, I've I've got a gun, and somebody's in, you know, coming near me, and I'm going to shout at them. What should I shout at them? 
Well, don't swear. That's the thing. Um, oh, be polite. Get away. <laughs> no, no. Well, think about it. Think about it from a legal perspective. All the witnesses, that, you know, because people aren't paying attention. Everyone's got their face in their mouth. Yeah. All they're going to hear is somebody swearing and then bang, bang. That's bad. Besides, it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't help your position. And it doesn't help get that guy away from you without having to shoot. Nice, clear, get away, stop. Or put your hand if you feel Well, like should, you should you say, stop, I'm armed, I have a gun? Possibly. Um, I don't see where it would hurt. But I don't see where it would be necessarily required. Do you want to say, stop, I'm armed? Or do you just want to yell, stop, go it? Which one's easier to say? Which one is easier to understand? This is why when you hear people... Uh, well, I think it might have a little more gravitas if you know that there might be a projectile coming at your head. Uh, yes, possibly. but also in any high adrenaline situation, do you think you're going to be that eloquent? It depends on the person. But if I, you know, I'm asking this question in that well before this situation would ever happen, considering the situation which is programming myself for the situation. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. that's good. This is what I teach my this is what I teach my students. If you're going to practice defensive shooting, you should be yelling at that paper. It feels weird. It sounds like you're. If you're on the range and there's only one guy yelling "stop," it looks a little funny. I'm sure people are self-conscious. This is why you can go to private ranges. You can scream your heart out. Um, it's rehearsal. It your, you got to rehearse. It's well, it's training for every everything requires training. But he's yeah. good at anything. You know, and if it's an automatic response now, when your gun comes out of its holster and you're yelling, stop, you've already pushed him away, you all he'll strike the face, whatever it is you've had to do, you know, maybe that's enough. You don't have to shoot them. But you can't just train with that. You also have to train threat identification. It, these are things I teach. You know, if they drop that gun and you still press that trigger, you're going to jail. You know, if, if I'm assaulted in the street somewhere, you know, and I push the guy away. I, maybe he doesn't hit me with his first shot or whatever. I finally get a, you know, get my gun out of its holster, and by that point he's realized I'm armed too. Drops his gun, puts his hands up. If I've trained to always fire immediately, I'm going to jail because I'm going to put a bullet in it, and I don't need to. It's called a training school. You have to train. You have to train right. This is why you need to come to TerrorismLLC.com and call Terrorist Mobile Firearms. <laughs> Terrorist Mobile Firearms Training. And will help eliminate those trainings. You get a lot of those from subpar or mass training classes. Other, on other places. The the one on one really is invaluable. It is. It really is. It yeah. is. You're you're basically you know, you're you're there. You're doing your thing, and I'm watching you. I'm not watching you and your buddy. You and your buddy and three of your friends trying to make sure you're safe. We can actually watch you get a couple of different angles go, okay, you're doing this wrong. Mm-hmm. Hey, this could be a problem. That could be a problem. Hey, you're not clearing your shirt high enough before you draw from concealment. Or you know, you're anticipating the shot. It all need, it, the whole thing needs to be trained in. You know? And I, I do wish more people did, did more training, even on their own. There's ways to do it. There are a couple of good YouTube channels. The problem's finding which one's good and which one is just important. No. No. Have you considered perhaps a recurring training package? Like refresher training, uh, refresher training, refresher training every like six months or something? I have a couple. Uh, I have a couple of people who, you know, realize that, you know, it's always best to get out there and have somebody else look at you. And I also offer the service of, hey, you know, you're out there. Maybe you and your friend went out to a private bay somewhere and you've taken shots that say you're low and left. Or you're just not, it doesn't feel right. Shoot me a video. I'll evaluate that for free. But if you want me to come out, that's that's where the money comes in. Right. I can watch a five minute video and go, okay, you're doing this wrong. Um, since you are, you know, somebody who does this for a living, as part of being a responsible gun owner, how, what would you suggest would be the minimum amount of range try range time and training time to to maintain yourself and your firearms? That's a good question. Profitably, I'd say it comes to me every week at $75. <laughs> <laughs> but ideally, I look at it like golf instruction. There's there's a lot of stuff you can do with instructor. 
but there's a lot of stuff you can do and you don't have to be out on the golf course to practice golf. You can go into your backyard and practice your chipping. You can go into your garage or find some flat wall space and practice the hip movement required for your drive. There are items and equipment out there that people can train off range and get just as good training. The only thing you're getting at the range is that actual bang, okay, which is essential. You do need to have that. But more than more important than that is the muscle memory. The skills required to do everything leading up to the bang and do it correctly. Okay, so I can give you one skill. They okay, go home, practice this for the next two weeks. Okay, just you know, give it 10 minutes a day or one hour, you know, whatever time you have, put it in there. And the next time you come to the range, we'll test that skill. We'll see if you're, you know, it'll show usually if they've actually done it, how many people you know, took their music lessons as a kid, like, oh, yes, I practiced my trombone all week last week. No, you didn't. And it showed. Um, but I could just easily come to your house with a laser setup. You know, or even, heck, I can, I can pull out the, the, kind of the airsoft gun. I can get the same read on you, just not necessarily at the same distance of a target. I have to shoot, shrink everything down. Kind of like how the Army does their rifle, their rifle training. Instead of actually forcing you to shoot at 500, well, they shoot at 500 yards anyway, but instead of forcing you to shoot actually at 300 yards, accounting for wind, accounting for rain, they bring it into 35, 35 yards. Yeah, my brain's not functioning on all cylinders. But if you still get all the, you get all the basics. You just don't have that last little bit. Because when I went through basic, you know, boot camp you know, at Paris Island, it's rainy, it's windy, and eventually, you know, after a week or so, you're still hitting the black in a, in a hurricane at 500 yards. Hmm. Okay. It depends on how much training you want to do, how much you want to put into it, and what your objectives are to get out of it. And if you're going to be an Olympic level comp Olympic competition shooter, you're going to be doing that eight, nine hours a day every day for you know the next three years until the next games come through um, right your sole purpose in carry or your sole purpose in having that gun is for when that person comes up to you within you know within spitting distance within arm's reach then um, then you're better off at home practicing to draw or push away of the individual and that first you know that first one or two shots from what's called a retention position. Wait, what was I that know. called? Your, your your volume cut out a little bit. Oh, sorry. Uh, from a retention position, basically you've got your gun back by your hip, or back where it comes wherever it comes up level on you towards the person or the target in front of you. Okay? But you're keeping it away from them, keeping them from grabbing it. Now here I am trying to teach with my hands, and I can't do that right now. Very. Narrow field of view. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Obviously, we have to go and take your course. I mean, that's that's clear, isn't it? Yes. I thought that was perfect. Well, it, it, it is, but I also, I, I dole out <laughs> a lot of free training. Okay, if I'm out of the range on the rare day off that I have, if I see somebody who's just egregious, I'll stop. I'll give them a card and I say, "Listen, I can't help you. Let me give you five minutes." Later. Yeah. Usually, they'll come in, or you know, they'll they'll take that five minutes and they'll get a little bit better. But will they practice it to where it's no longer muscle memory? Or to where it is muscle memory? Maybe, maybe not. Or I'll just show them what their correct stance should be. And will they practice that? Probably not. But if they, if they don't, they can come see me. They've got my card. And they go, wow, I shot really good with that guy. Let's go back. And I have some people who they come back. They call me eh, every six weeks, whenever they've got time. Most of my clients are independently employed, self-employed. Uh, which you'd think would mean you'd have a lot of free time. No, these guys don't. Because um, I certainly I'm always, if I'm not guarding things, I'm at meetings, net business yeah. network, watching people's brains explode. You'll wait, you're a gun guy? Yes. <laughs> you end up finding ways to fill that time real easy. Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> so being a trainer, you see just how bad people are. Huh? Even after they've got the gun, they've got all the licenses, they've got all the paperwork in order, but they're still pathetic uh -huh. and dangerous. Potentially. What they're using that, there, there's always the potential of danger. I personally would love to see everybody come in to requalify on every skill you have to be 
that you, you have out there. You know, bicycle riding every five years, go up to the DMV, but that's not going to happen. That's an unreasonable imposition on people's time just to make them a marginally better to demonstrate competence. But I, 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 get, I get where you're heading with that, and they should be they took more training. But we can't force them. We can't force them to go back to driver's ed until one incident actually happens. It, with driver's ed, though, most of the time, it does not end up being you're going back to driver's ed because you uh, committed vehicular manslaughter. No, it's usually because you try. DUI, <laughs> excessive texting while driving, things like that. But we also have to consider, once again, we brought up the Fourth Amendment a while ago, and I'm, I know you guys are going to hate this part. Yeah, we're going to bring up the well-regulated part of well-regulated militia, and regardless, it's right. How much do we regulate that right versus the privilege? Um, well, that's that's I, the I, thing. I, I how much re- how much regulation do we have, and are you actually now a member of a militia? Uh, here's where I get to the my second sticky question. I mean, actually, you're an ex-marine. You're, you're a former marine. Of course, really, once a marine, always a marine. So, hoorah. I think it's uh, Title 10 says you know, all of us are in the militia. Um, hmm. I don't know. I, I did I, sign up for selective service, but I had to because I wanted loans. So, but women aren't. Yeah, we need to fix that. I, the generals have said they quality. need to fix that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Go ahead and bring me your sticky question, though. Oh, well, my brain is still firing on all cylinders. Okay. <laughs> Again. Most cylinders. It, it, it goes to the, the regulation part. We regulate a number of things far more stringently at state level and at federal level than we do firearms. And we, a lot of people deem it necessary for uh, the preservation of life, I've heard argued, in uh, just how much we regulate abortion. Now, I'm saying we should just regulate to the level of, you know, vehicles. But I've also heard others say we should regulate firearms as much as we regulate what women can do with their bodies. I I was trying to figure out how you're going to regulate fetuses and, like, vehicles. It's like, okay, so wait a second. (laughs) You know, because there are plenty of people out there that I'd love to have seen actually end up having to get a... um, uh, a, a parenting license before they actually did so, but um, slightly fascist. But I, I can see where you're coming from. I, I see those people every couple of days. Well, I no, not fascist, just judgmental. Very, very judgmental. <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you okay? You say guns should be regulated to the level of a woman's body. So we can't bring the women into the bank. We can't take them across state lines necessarily. I can't sell her. Uh, well, suddenly we're in Saudi Arabia. Well, no, that, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, but if you want, to have a woman no, no. If you want abortion. to have an abortion, you, you many times you have to go someplace that's not local. You have to stay there for at least twenty-four hours. It's been made. Uh, it's been made extremely yeah. oppressive. It's been made in, it has. And you I'm have not, to. See, Sit down and have uh, counseling at counseling and video against this, and it's it for your best interest I, that I you don't. You, and I, I oppose all this. I'm, I'm a big fan of letting a woman do what she wants with her body. And it's her body; she has the personal liberty to go and get an abortion if she wants one. Okay. I understand where they're coming from on some of this. You know, I've met some conservatives. I, like I, hear, you know, I hear you. You say it's murder. And I, I, I hear you. But you know, the Supremes have ruled that it's a, it's a parasite until like twenty weeks or something. I don't know. I, I, I haven't had But abortion. again, yeah. I, it's just I'm. We we regulate certain things to an extreme. And it is extreme. I think we should get uh, rid of. It. But I'm going. For for having guns and for the, a reasonable regulation on firearms, I think Could it should. Firearm the person. We need to regulate the firearms because people are harder to regulate. 
once it gets difficult doesn't mean you can't do it. it well, that's a little more government, well, no, right? A little more but tax. okay, so it makes it more difficult. You know, that's okay. Well, yeah, it makes it it, it makes a it hard time regulating. Things. It makes it more difficult for the consumer. That's right. Which is okay. Because it's not taking the right away. You can still do it, but you need to go through the proper steps to make sure that you're safe. Sure. That doesn't restrict you from having it. I, 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 I hear you, and I've heard a lot of these arguments before, and I, I just want to know, you know, what do we do? Like, people are flipping out now because we have the Trump administration, you know, going, swinging wildly right on a bunch of stupid shit. I wish it were some of the issues, but, you know, and that's, that's absolutely not a good that They're quote the Cromulans, not cool. Um, well, to, to, be, to be honest about all this, you know, we were talking about this before Trump. So this yeah. is consistent across the board, regardless of yeah. who's in the administration. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about this when Obama was still in office. Yeah. So he was the, yeah, the world's best gun sales. Anyway, but let's look at what happened in a state that had uh, some form of regulation and imposed a certain level of control. Well, let's look at what happened to Katrina, okay, when uh, the... Ah, that's the name of the parish. What's the parish sheriff's office then? Irrelevant. Irrelevant, um, yeah. Yeah, but that basically people were trying to evacuate by boat, because it's what you do in the swamp. Um, yeah. And every time the sheriff came across somebody, they'd say, hey, you got any guns? They'd say, yeah, and they'd take them. Okay? It took two or three federal lawsuits and five, seven, five or seven years before people even remotely got their, got their firearms back, because... The government decided that that was the best way to go about it. They had a list of who had it. If they found you, on, you know, if they found you on your boat. They went and took that too. I'm not saying everybody's coming from with guns. But not. Well, but, there's also a big civil forfeiture issue. Yeah, right that's well. insane. Uh, yeah, seriously, it's uh, ridiculous. And I, I think, like, I think we could probably chalk that incident up to civil forfeiture as much as anything else. Those yeah, were the. They, they got- Highest ticket, yeah. num- highest value items that they happen to have on them at the time. Yeah. Um, I also look at New York State. Um, I'm yeah. waiting for somebody to get a B in their bonnet. We have the SAFE Act. That required registration of the 130,000 AR-15s that were supposedly in the state. Might be more, might be less. I don't know. And there's, sadly, there's only 3,000 of those registered. Again, my numbers are horrible. There was a large number out there, a very small number registered, because even they don't trust their own government to know what they've got, because they think they're going to come at it. We look at Los Angeles. Los Angeles? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the, longest- that's the narrative, though, is that if we get registered, then they'll know right where to come and get them. Well, if, if, if you know how many guns I've got, yes, but how many guns do I have? How many yeah, guns? But you, but you know how many cars I own. I have no idea how many cars you own. The yeah, government the does. does. I, 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 yeah, the, the government does. does. I don't know how many guns you have. That's, that's Should true. the state? I, I, I'm just not a big fan of that. Yeah, but the state knows how many vehicles I'm operate, which vehicles I'm insured to operate on the public street. Yeah, yes, right, but, but in uh, order this, to, I had even, a follow like, up for this earlier in, in regards to. Okay. I mean, I think you're making the argument we're making in regards to that. So, like when you talk about the farm trucks, that mm-hmm. would be the equivalent to your home defense weapon. As long as you're leaving that weapon at home, I don't care if you have that registered and that, those. That's a gun I no longer care about. Once you leave the house with that weapon, once you leave the farm with that truck. That's when I care about, uh, is it registered? Is it insured? Are you properly trained to operate it? That's when I care about it. So I think, in a way, we're making the same argument. You're saying the same thing because so your response to to um, Daniel, you know, saying, you know, which ones are operating and that kind of thing is, you know, publicly. And, and I think that's what we're talking about is, is a public responsible ownership in terms of, you know, that registration and that, you know, the, the possibility of insurance, um, which I, I wanted to tie it. Like I was curious earlier when you said it, it would tank the insurance industry. Why do you think that gun insurance would tank the insurance industry? Just a, a curiosity. 
Well, let's look at Newtown in Newtown, uh, Newtown, Connecticut incident and the Aurora, Colorado case. Okay, and great I'm, examples. I'm, I'm, I'm going to refuse to use their name. Bushmaster was sued by, by the parent. Okay, that lawsuit, last time I checked, again, the agencies have checked up on this, was allowed to proceed forward, at least to a certain extent. Um, how many, you know, was Bushmaster responsible for that shooting? So, so you're saying, well, uh, the reason, though, that the manufacturer of the weapon was sued was because there was no other recourse and it was trying to fo- it was more of a political gesture than it was anything else it might have uh, been. also I for the know. families in colorado a lot of the suits went uh ploying shaped as it were oh yeah and uh they now oh i know the theater which was also part of that suit um yeah. counter suit seven hundred thousand dollars yeah so no they're I, I, I can see where you're going with the insurance, but my, my thing there is by having the individual owner insured. They would be the ones that would be sued. protect the, the manufacturers. And, the, manufacturers and the venues. And the vendors, yeah. In mm-hmm. having, you, you, you have to have insurance in order to get the insurance because and get your license. You have to be qualified to operate the weapon. And to continue so the comparison be between vehicles and, and weapons in that regard, I get in an accident with Andy. I sue Andy and State Farm. I don't sue Andy and State Farm and Ford. So it would no longer be the manufacturer of the weapon that has to deal with that pending lawsuit in regards to that it's going to be the individual shooter and the insurance company you know uh that is insuring that particular you know person and when you look at in terms of numbers something like 2015 2016 you're looking at about reported um somewhere right around the area of just less than 40,000 gun deaths and injuries that are reported um just in car fatalities, you're at 35,000 as reported in 2015, and that doesn't include every fender bender that's going to nick your insurance. So, I mean, just in terms of numbers, you're going to see far less hits on an insurance. So, I mean, I that's why I was curious, it's just because the numbers seem like it would be something that would be supported at the same level or less than the number of claims we have yeah. in regards to vehicle. You know, the insurance, insurance companies would be fine with it because they they spread the damage over all of their yeah all of their people. And That's how it works. Responsible owners, where again, having the insurance. Yeah, someone like you what, with insurance would be. I mean, you're they, they essentially just paying to pay at that point. You yeah. know, like the yeah, safe but, driver but, from nationwide. <laughs> also, at the same time, having insurance should an accident in the home happen, especially with the insured firearm can help the individual i'm also looking at homeowners insurance yeah i wouldn't well that would be homeowners insurance but then then you're also back to the same argument of having the farm truck you know that's the weapon that's that's the house weapon it's just there yeah it's never going elsewhere but so how much should this insurance cost well that's that's a good question but that's also for the insurance professionals to come up with i think yeah. auto insurance costs too much already so yeah. i i uh, probably yeah. couldn't really consider yeah but I mean, the the point cost. wouldn't be to make ownership prohibitive that it, yeah it, no, it would yeah, not at all it would be the same you know it, you compare it to i mean i'm sure there's a metric for you know what the average claim paid out with vehicle insurance is plus overhead and all that yeah. together is where they end up coming from their bottom line cuz automobile so you, insurance isn't designed to make automobiles prohibitive to own and operate like just going over my personal personal I mean, insurance i already think it's kind of extortion anyway but like, it's mm-hmm. still something that we have to have for the protection well, I mean, of was, everybody around us and one other point if Fred borrows my car and he gets into an accident, whose insurance is on the hook? Mine. Well, no, mine. Really? Yes, uh, it is the owner. I, 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 it is the owner, and the person that has insured the vehicle that gets put on the hook for anything that happens with that vehicle. That vehicle. So it could I'm also be the same thing for that weapon. I personally like the USAA model. It doesn't matter what car. I get. Yes, my car is insured as well, but I can get into any vehicle and i carry my coverage with me 
you that may be an you do situation. for your personal coverage. You do not for the vehicle. True, but it may be an alternative to registration. There's a lot of people that really don't want that. That might not balk so much at the idea of paying a certain amount to exercise their their rights. I mean, we paid we paid a vote. We 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 pay two cross state lines. We pay you know we don't. Uh, well, we don't pay to cross speak. state lines. We we pay to speak in public. No, we don't. No, no, we don't. It's pretty much just. The, but driving, we do. Driving, that's mm -hmm. one. I'm looking at one through ten. No, twenty-seven. No, it's not any. That's not any of those enumerated rights. Uh, now we now we do have to. Well, driving is not a right. No, no, it's not. O owning a firearm is. However, dri just, However, owning a house. Owning a house is also not a right. right. Having sure. clean water is not in the Bill of Rights either. But no, we also think that people should have that. Yeah. Also, clean air is not a right. Right. But we think people should not have cancer but even, just for breathing but air. Yeah, if they you have want the should to... To have, have clean water. I have the right to protect myself. I have the right to do so with the implement of my choosing, provided it's not... Yeah, actually, the but right, the the right that... to protect yourself is not there. Where is the no. right to protect yourself? There is no right to protect yourself. There is a right for a well-regulated militia. Regulated. Which is for the betterment of the state, not yeah. for the individual. Individual. I hear what you're saying. I disagree. I wish I was more eloquent to say on the right. <laughs> I'm not. Like I said, feed me crayons and happy. Uh, uh, I feel that my right to self-defense stems not from any paper of the government's recognition of my rights. Right? It's like your right to clean water, your right to clean air, mm -hmm. right? your right to, right to marry whom you choose. Okay? And it shouldn't be something that I have to pay up, you know, pay up. Okay? So there are certain <laughs> rights that are inalienable. <laughs> yeah, amazing. That are yeah. not necessarily codified in any um, any written I just, docums. I just know in in any other yeah. thing where you're operating something hazardous or can cause loss of life, there should be a liability. Th th there, there is a heavy level of regulation every time we have an airplane accident. There, there is a lot of focus on safety. I mean, the reason we have seatbelt laws is because of loss of life. We have a massive loss of life due to firearms. I think we should deal with it in the same manner that we deal with car accidents and airplane accidents at least give it that much view and at least that much time, effort, and regulation. I'm not saying you should pay through the nose. I'm not saying that you should lose your access to firearms. What I'm saying is that there's a level of personal responsibility and competence that should be proved by the individual in order to own and operate a firearm. Especially when you have things like the gun show loophole where you can just buy a weapon out of somebody's trunk and you don't have to track that. You don't have to, I, you don't have to do a background check on them because it is legal that you don't have to when it's a private sale. I also don't have to do a background check if I build my own. Right. If I go to, if I go to it's Home a, Depot, should we, should we ban Home Depot? Because I can it's a commodity it item. It, it, Weapons in many cases end up being a commodity item. They are. But at the same time, there's a liability for, for intent and what you do with those things. So to protect the society, shouldn't we put some sort of measure in place that at least fosters a responsibility? Yeah, mandatory education in all public schools, starting in Marin County, California. <laughs> because I like watching people go nuts. <laughs> well, again... E it is elective to own a firearm. It is, yeah. So I, I don't see having mandatory education. I am perfectly fine with having, in order to, in order to operate a firearm in public, I will give you that. 
if you are going to carry and transport a firearm in public. Why is there a concealed carry license at all? Well, that's actually an interesting story because way, way back in the day, you know, provided you weren't in any of the major cities, most guys just carried their gun on their hip. They carried openly. You got it. You had to get your concealed permit if you wanted to be one of them low down shadwinder types that wanted to carry a hidden gun. You were a quote man. You carried your weapon, your gun, your knife, your sword, what have you, you know, where everyone could see it. You made the proclamation. But why would why is there even a law for a concealed weapons permit at all? And why stop there? I'm not really a fan of it. I mean it would kill my it would kill my business model, but Arizona doesn't seem to be doing too badly with their anyone can carry a gun model. Yeah, but Arizona's Arizona. Arizona's another another unique snowflake amongst all of our states. Well, how about Vermont? Vermont doesn't have a carry permit and they're doing okay. I, you can just go. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just want yeah. people to, if you're going to be carrying a firearm in public, I want want you to, one, I want that gun to be registered. So should an incident happen, it can be tracked with that firearm. It makes it easier for law enforcement. It also makes it easier for the insurer. This is a, a corporate convenience. Um, and then... We do like I, corporate conveniences here in this country. Yeah. Um, it, it speeds things up. It speeds things through re- the bureaucracy. But I also want the individual who is is owning and operating that firearm or carrying that firearm in public to be insured should something happen. It also puts a a onus on responsibility of ownership. You know, your there, health insurance premiums would also go up. Um. Because you're, if you are a gun owner, you are in a demographic that is more likely to be involved in a shooting which injures you. Uh, also, well, your life insurance might be co Okay. My, my life insurance pays up no matter what, once I hit two years. But anyway, um, I get you. I, I hear you. And I, those, are, those are some valid points of required consideration. So who pays when that criminal shoots me? Well, I'm not a... It would either be the and if if someone else shoots you, it would either be the the perpetrator's insurance, whatever they happen to have, if they had any. Otherwise, it would be your own medical insurance that would cover your injuries, and then you'd have to sue for damages because that's the way the country works right now. But Correct. you could sue sue for damages. However, you can you can't get money from a stone. So if they have no money because they were trying to rob you for your for your money in the first place, then you're not going to get anything from them, and... Eh, sorry, tough luck. You've just wasted all of your time. So there's no point in that. But if they had insurance, or if you had insurance, then such an incident would be covered by that insurance carrier, and you could sue the insurance company, because they've got all the money. I hear you. That's something... It's, it's something I've, I've, I've considered, but again, you know, we have these, 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 these right? We have people who can't, can barely afford their home defense firearm. Case in point, we have an incident. That I don't have a firearm. No, so, so we have people that do. Uh, yeah, but that you know, do they really need them? Afford. Well, like I said, here, here's, my, here's my case in point. This happened okay. back in July in just south of Heathrow Airport. And an individual living in his camper. He and his sister have been living there for the past 50 years. They live hand to mouth. They have no running water. They have no access to heat, fuel, light source, anything like that. Uh, in July, two individuals decided to roll up to their house, start hacking a hole in their door. Um, these individuals, in addition to the machete they were using to break in with, carried uh, zip strips, bleach, a funnel, a mallet. And yet the survivor claimed that they weren't intending to hurt them. That's irrelevant. To the, story. Um, the individual poked his double-barreled shotgun through the hole these guys created in the door and blasted one of them in the chest. He's still going to jail for because, because he couldn't afford the license for his shotgun. Not saying it's not, and it's not prohibitively expensive. It is a hundred and four dollars 
to get your shotgun license in, under, from the Metropolitan Police Department in Britain. It is $64 to renew. And this is translated from... Uh, yeah, translated from, Brit- from British pounds. pounds so. Yeah, yeah, British, British pounds. That was, a, that was extortionate to this guy. So where do we go? Hey, you want people to pay for the insurance, pay for the coverage. That's part of what your licensing fee pays for as long as you have background check and all this. Where do we add that line? That's not necessarily a bad thing. There also are there are advantage. people that there are people that can't. Well, one that's Britain, so that is oh, yeah, a, that know, is a different true. that is a different case. Uh, oh, yeah. They they famously, you know, have have big gun laws there and prevent people from having them. I mean, uh, now they're trying to actually regulate, you know, knives. Yeah, at the, that. that point, they're they're yeah. having a giant surgeons in knife crime. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, if you look to our neighbors in the north, they regulate all sorts of things. They do. Like, they even just deregulated their, their, their long gun registry because it wasn't their long No, it's their, uh, how would the heck they call their book? Uh, You're getting uh, quieter and quieter. Sorry, yeah. Is this better? I don't think it's coming through that microphone. I think no. it's coming through your phone. How's this? Yep, it's coming through yep. your phone. Okay, well, all righty then. We'll just pull this right back up here. Oh god, that's help? so much better. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, see, I can't, I can't, I can hear you guys oh, through yes. the phone. I, I can't hear me. I can hear me through the speakers. Okay. Or sorry, I can hear you. Through, I can hear me through, or hear you guys through my headphones. But anyway. Yeah, this um, is the much better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what what the what the the, the database they had in Canada that they just got rid of because it was absolute abs effing useless. Uh, it's basically where you have a fired shell sent to uh, sent to the state police. They had it in Maryland. For Actually, they still have it in Maryland because they haven't learned from Canada. Uh, basically, if, if you buy a new firearm, uh, one, sh- one fired casing has to be sent to the state police for storage in a library, uh, processing, typing, and all. It's like a fingerprint for your gun. Right, yeah, okay. the rifling pattern. The only, yeah. the only, the only, what, what the Canadians found out about that was, well, after about 1,000 rounds, it changes. fingerprint changes. Yeah. This is, you know, they, they regulate a lot of stuff in Canada, and you know, there's, the Canadians are getting pissed about it. I have Canadians that come down here and call me just to go shooting, which is nice because, man, they got some money. They're, they're government, so it's, you know. Interesting. They get paid. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'm some proposing things. something far more moderate. I, I, I believe in moderation when it comes to regulation. I hear you. I'm not and, necessarily saying you're absolutely wrong. I'm just not saying you're right. I say it needs a lot more thought. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think having a a registry. I mean, we have VIN numbers on cars. Mm-hmm. I I think that that is perfectly reasonable. I I think That's having a a reasonable level of insurance. I don't know what that number is, but That's I do right. think having watch. that insurance should be a thing. I. Bet. I think it might be an idea, but I think it might not be an idea. I, again, I'm, I'm not a policy guy. I'm just here to teach you how to be safe and how to, how to hopefully oh, not have a confrontation. We're very just, much in opinion at this nice. point. Very much in opinion. And oh, there was okay. one, other, one other question from, from our other correspondent. Uh, knife okay. versus gun. Which is better to carry for personal defense? For defense? Uh, how fast can you draw the knife? How fast can you draw the gun? Uh, what are the engagement distances? Um, if somebody's coming down the street at me, gun all the way because standoff distance is always better than getting up in close with somebody, especially if they already have a knife. Uh, but if they're already up in close to you, uh, a knife is easier to draw sometimes. It doesn't require pulling up, pulling out, twisting around just to fire. Uh, that's, that's a tactical decision that you're going to have to make based on your threat environment. Or... In consultation with Interitus LLC dot com. Yeah. Excellent plug. Excellent plug. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm getting the hang of this. This is you know for this is the first gun interview I've done. So, well, I think that you've done well. I don't know if we've done well, mm-hmm. but I think you've done just fine. Yeah. So you're doing good. Yeah, so um, I've told some told some friends about this. They're like, "What? They're progressive liberals." I'm like, "Well, you know, I can't get the ideas out there if I don't get into into that, uh, you know, into 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 that space." And same, you know, y'all your your ideas, some of which may not necessarily be bad, like insurance. Um, they're not going to find any traction if you just keep repeating them in the echo chambers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I mean, out into the 
guns are fun. I'm I'm perfectly fine with responsible gun okay. ownership. I I work next door to like Orlando's premier gun range. Uh, I hear Orange the range. automatic fire. Yeah. Every day at work. It's one of those where yeah, come on down and fire a fully automatic weapon for fun. Yeah, they, they are fun, but they, those those yeah those require training. Otherwise, you're just not going to hit what you're aiming at. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you have to control the fire hose. So pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Every every time you know every time it fires, it goes up a little bit and up a little further. Now the Brits did create. I wish I could remember the name. They created a fully automatic pistol with a little electrical, electrically actuated motor that every time you fired, it counteracted the muzzle rise with this just weight on a on a this spinning weight would all the all the it would all be heading down as your muzzle's trying to climb, keeping you basically gyroscopically stabilized. So they put a flywheel in it, something like yeah, that. But it's like okay. not, not not all all the weights all you know, all the weights on one side of the flywheel. So every time you, you know, every time the muzzle tries to rise, the weight is pulling oh, it back that, down. Similar to what they yeah. did with a with like a timing Cross chain angles. on on the old um, the old Spitfires, so they you wouldn't blow out your yeah. propeller as you fired. Yeah, it's just it, you know, just this set up a timing though. chain kind of thing. Kinda, yeah. It's just this little Maybe. spinning wheel. It's pretty awesome. I thought that. Took a, that took a lot of you know, creativity to make, but you can't get one here in the states. Uh, well, you, I, let me rephrase that: you probably could because they were built before 1986. Uh, you it's probably just cost a lot. you probably just oh. could anyway. Uh, import licenses would kill you, but yeah, no, you, you probably well, could. Fully auto? Oh, no, uh, well, I think pretty sure full auto weapons importation. Pretty sure that's banned too. Anything manufactured after 86 banned, which is kind of a shame because what I want, I want to try the Glock 18. The Glock 18 is a full auto Glock. Hmm. I don't know what I'd use it for, but it'd be fun to shoot. But you can't get them. You know, and frankly, I want an HK MP5. You know, I, I still think that's the premier close quarters, you know, close quarters weapon um, versus the M4s or anything else. It's nice, it's short, shoots the nine millimeter or the forty. It does, you know, it's not going to do a whole heck of a lot of damage. You know, where you don't want it, it's controllable, but uh, the last time I saw one for sale, it was twenty five thousand dollars. That's for an H and K MP five. That's expensive. That, that's, that's an investment. But but that's <laughs> that's the market. I I mean I would love to have Part you know scarcity induced. some some of those really nice cars, but boy are they expensive. Yeah, <laughs> so much fun to drive. Yeah. Now, um, what what's your opinion on the bump stock? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a piece of crap. Um, I, I I've shot them a couple times. I get a lot of jams out of them. Uh, I I think it's basically be it's it's being used as a scapegoat for some dude who flew under the radar for a long time. I mean, we're still they're still asking questions about this shooting. Um, he is a, get the answers. He was a bizarre no, dude. Not. Yeah, that's it he was, a was. He was really a interesting rich, case. Most rich people are. And most any the, the, any time you introduce a new gun implement to mm. the general public who has no idea about right. guns most of the time, you're going to have that scapegoat. And so most people were not familiar with bump stocks before it became a highlighted piece in that story. And so that's yeah. where that scapegoat is going to come from. It's, it's happened... also the only thing we can grab onto because he was just so yeah. aloof. Right. And, and, so you, there was, you, 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 you there notice was... that in any of the, the major shooting, you know, like those type yeah. of things. I mean, even go back to um, something like Columbine where the scapegoat, one of the scapegoats Maryland at the Manson. time wasn't even gun related. And you're coats. talking about trench coats. Yeah, trench coats. Tr the yeah. trench coat because yeah. it was an easy way for them to conceal the gun. So I mean, it's not yeah. even you're you know always going to have that scapegoat, yeah. you know. Part, yeah. So no, I just I I I fired a few. Like I said I've never fired a good one. Um. So maybe if you know somebody took me out, we fired a nice one. But at the same time, I, you know, I like my I like the rate of fire on my AR-15. I think it's perfectly fine. You know, the whole point of the AR-15 is not spray and pray. That's Soviet tactics. Uh, that's that's all them. They just put it down range. The AK-47, not the most accurate of rifles, but the doctrine of mass fires from the Soviet era meant that, you know, they were going to hit somebody at some point. You know, the big wall of lead's going down range. Um, I, know, I could take them or leave them. Uh, I, I do know some people are making uh, a, a ton of money on them, having 
bought them a couple of years ago, 25, 30 bucks. And I uh, saw one guy walking around the gun show, 300. One yeah. three hundred dollars for pump stock. Okay, so let me not surprised. I'd I'd like to get your take on something like that, um, where as a country recently, I mean we're talking in the last twenty, thirty years, you've seen, you know, these these type of incidents occur and then you see that they do become a catalyst for increased sales. And something like that with the bump stock where you're saying like they, they paid twenty five bucks and now all of a sudden it's it's three hundred. What do you think spurs that in terms of uh, like like does that influence your buying as a, a gun owner and you know some Not really, although it probably should because I, I'm pretty sure stocks go up on stuff like that. But that would be incredibly heartless and callous to do. Uh, but people do it and that's their right. This is America. You can be heartless, callous and make money. That's you know, greed is good, as Gordon Gecko put it. But um, yeah, the American way. Yeah, but uh, you know, I've 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 lived under worse. Uh, but anyway, the uh, you know, it's just a, a drive to make a little bit of cash. Uh, the people buy them up faster because they think that it's. You basically told an American now you can't have something, or we're thinking about making it to where you can't have something. Yeah. So yeah. price goes up, people buy them. Uh, you know, Why'd you buy that? The because they didn't want me to. Pretty much, yeah. It, it, regardless of what it is, whether it's yeah. guns, whether it's books, movies, uh, disco records, uh, you know, every, you know, everything you know, you say. You'll never no, take you my bell bottoms. Oh, uh, yeah, please take <laughs> bell bottoms. They're coming back. <laughs> I, I don't. They are. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, the Navy hit me are. up when I was considering which service. I'm like, nope, nope, <laughs> no bell bottoms. <laughs> like, I'm sure you guys are fun, but uh -uh, no, I don't mind anything. I'm just, no, I can't wear that uniform. Sorry. Uh, the Marines <laughs> were the only ones who were really straight up with me and returned my phone calls. Uh, the Air Force decided to wait two weeks. But, yeah, they're lost. Um, Absolutely. They're lost. It's, it's just, you know, you tell an American they can't have something, they're going to go out and buy it. Uh, when I bought my AR-15, I originally started looking for an AR in, I want to say, August, September time frame of 2012. Uh, and I called a couple companies and I figured, you know what, may, I might pay a, a couple hundred more, but I want to you know, support one of my local companies. And I called them and they quoted me a price on a, a pretty, pretty decent AR-15. They were like, yeah, it'll be $1,400. I mean, it had some bells and whistles on it. Um, this is, you know, lo totally local build, everything, you know, either sourced locally or assembled locally, handcrafted in China. Um, but <laughs> yeah, then Newtown happened. Okay. And suddenly you saw bottom of the barrel, $600 AR 15s also selling for 14, 15, $2,000. And I called, I called these guys and I said, Hey, how much now? I figured, you know, we'll see, we'll see what their integrity levels like. And, nope. They said $1,400. Yeah. Very well. Here's my money. Is it the ultimate AR I want? No, but it's my first AR. I'm going, me and the wife plan to do a build very soon. It's going to be a very specific barmenting rig. And we want to be able to go out, go, you know, plink metal targets at 500 yards, and then also, you know, get the rabbits out of the garden 200 yards away without leaving the, the cool shade of the porch. Because, guys, it gets hot down here. You want to stay under the shade. True enough. True enough. No, yeah. no, no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah, we want to live in the country. Yeah. The city, the city sucks. Any, any city. I'm just not a big fan. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, I want my hundred plus acres. I want my. Uh, that'd be nice. Oh God, is it? Uh, that's why I took the security gig. Thirty bucks an hour is eventually going to result in a very nice down payment on some land. It should. Some, it should. Hopefully, until land prices spike again. But I don't want good land. I want crap land. I want land where I don't have any neighbors. So if I want to host a shoot in the mm -hmm. middle of the night. You know, if I say for my law enforcement clients, I can get out there, turn on the flashing blue and red strobes, and we can go to town without bothering the neighbors. That's actually a really great idea, and probably so, and probably something that you could write off too. Oh yes, oh no. What I plan to do? <laughs> I'm going to buy the Bill Joyner is going to buy the land. Bill Joyner is going to buy the land, and then he's yeah. going to lease it to Interitus. Yes. Do... There you go. That's the way to go with it. Definitely. I have a go. good. I have a good accountant. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, uh, accounting wise, I think that oh, it's late. So, yeah, um, I want to respect I your time. Five hour time ahead of me. 
Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to respect your time and thank you very much for imparting yes. all the knowledge. Thank and, you. And um, I, well. I hope that uh, I hope that you'll be part of the O'Reilly Radio family here and and come back sometime. Sometime, sometime. Give me a call if you if you need an opinion. I I, I do think of more things than just this, but uh, hopefully I won't pull a twelve hour shift with loads of drama beforehand. Mm. Yeah, hopefully not. All right. Yeah, I was a security guard. I was at a bank today, and it was – it's Friday. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I bet you yeah. you have got to have some of the most amazing stories. Not yet. It's just mostly just irritating weirdos. <laughs> Nothing fun. Just like, really, sir? Get out. <laughs> I don't know. Irritating they, weirdo stories are pretty good, too. They can be. Especially uh, over a couple know. beers. I think that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah, next time I'm in Florida. Excellent. Up, it's – yeah, should be down there sooner or later at some point if I got money. But uh, thanks for having me, guys. I had, a, I had an interesting talk. Uh, and, of course, where can our audience find you more of you? Okay, well, they can, they can you know, catch, catch me at my, you know, my website, interitusllc.com, I-N-T-E-R-R-I-T-U-S-L-L-C.com. Or they can just give me, give me a call or a text, 325-260-3822. Uh, do keep the text... Keep the trolling to the website, please. Please don't you know, text me in the middle of the night. I do have a real job as well as this one. Uh, <laughs> please, guys. Uh, you can also you know, check me out. On, you know, I do partner with some companies, defensivefirearmsgroup.com. We work together a lot. He was a former client of mine who decided he wanted to do what I do. So I made him start his own company for liability purposes. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. Plus See, insurance. Own- See, it's all about... No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll leave Texas insurance laws to another day, shall we? Oh, it would take a whole day. Absolutely, it would oh, take a whole day. Yeah. So oh, try uh, the land laws. Oh God, uh, I I have one question. In Teridus, where did where did you come up with that name? Well, um, I found when I when I first started, you know, getting along to teaching professionally because I, I said I've been involved in teaching nine to twenty years. Okay. About, yeah, about 20 years uh, when I did that, when I did the math last time. And it was mostly it was un, it wasn't professionalized instruction. It wasn't an NRA instructor. It's just, hey, we got to go walk and go to the range or, hey, just, I want to shoot my gun better. Like, sure, let's go out. But when I was moving out here from Camp Lejeune, hey, me and the wife, we stopped off to see some of our friends in Atlanta and we met some people there. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm a single mom and I've got my gun. I'm like, great. How often do you train? She's like, I don't. I'm like, we're going to the range right now. Let's go. Come on. Um, and then I realized, like, sh- the big thing about a lot of these people that go out and buy the gun for the self-protection is they're they're afraid of the gun. And I want them to be not afraid of the gun. So I looked around a couple of different languages because, frankly, no fear firearms sounds kind of bro, you know, and just maybe just a little, no. maybe a little, yeah, bro. just 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 a bit, and no, no, thank Color you, I am, not, nice. yeah, I am not bro, but. <laughs> Like, you know, sin miedo didn't work out well. And anything in German just sounds angry. Uh, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Tis started, true. Yeah, went, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Frau Buckout. Taught me just enough. Um, but uh, yeah, I looked around in Latin and came up with without fear, or fearless, uh, in you know, in you know, the state of being without fear is, I guess, is the best I could come up with because, well, I passed German. I failed Latin. Uh, <laughs> Latin sounds so much better than German, less less angry, more more elegant, and that's what I think. That's my big thing. I want people to be unafraid of their gun. If you're going to have one, great. Let me help you shoot it better. Let me help you be unafraid. Given that we're in a country that uh, we do enshrine our firearms, we were built not on the sword but on the on the gun in the old west, and you know the cowboys and whatnot. It's not going away. I have no. no illusions that we are ever going to outlaw firearms and that they're ever going to come and get your guns. That's not going to happen in this country because it would be a bloody uprising. So it's not going to happen. Okay. But we might as well get more sane about how we handle them, how we keep them. And that was what this conversation was about. So really, I think we're all on the same page. It's just... And I think Level. in terms of levels, how yeah. this conversation same book at least went and, and kind of what both sides can take away from it is that the conversation needs to continue having because you run into uh, gaps like in a situation where someone is calling for regulation on gun control and Bill is saying there is regulation on gun control. He's 
well versed in the regulation on gun control that currently exists. And so you get into this situation where, you know, what Daniel's calling for is more regulation. And when you say, I would like to see regulation on gun control, it's not communicating it effectively. And if you don't have this conversation the first time, you're not going to run into, yeah. you know, yeah. that, and, the, and the ability this, to learn it, from that. The, a lot of what we're, we're dealing with is also a lack of streamlining, it seems. It's very obtuse. Like, it, it's very obtuse. Um, and again, it's good from that our states can, 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 can come with their own regulations on firearms. But as you brought up, counties coming up with their own stuff just complicates things further. Municipalities. Mm-hmm. We, we need to have something where we, we get common sense and making it so that owning a firearm is, isn't a hassle, but also the ownership of a firearm, there is something that imparts the idea of the responsibility that comes with owning a firearm. Because it's not a toy, and there's too many people that treat it like a toy. And it is fun, and that's the problem. It's a fun toy. At least it can be. But because it's a fun toy, you don't give it the respect that it deserves, and people make make problems for everyone else. I would really like to not see mass shootings happen again. How the hell that's going to happen is awfully a, 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 a difficult conversation. That's, um, a, that's a separate conversation, because really, yeah. do you want to just talk about the mass shootings? Do you want to talk about mass killings? Because they're... If somebody is really determined to kill an awful lot of people, they're going to find a way to do it. I totally, Again, I totally bomb, understand that. Bombs are aren't too hard to no, make. No, and and but, really, but a, I don't a, think that when we're talking about mass shootings, what we're discussing with, you know, increased regulations or insurance or, or those steps, those are not your solutions no, to no. stopping mass shootings and mass killings. They are totally no. different you know, Mm -hmm. situations and conversations to have. So, and that's another thing that if people aren't having the conversation, it gets conflated. I think they help mitigate, though. You know, these are like the little mitigation steps that help to, you know, put the finger in the dike before it bursts. It is one piece of the puzzle in terms of things Or or at the very least, it makes it so that when something like this happens, law enforcement has an, an easier means of investigating this and with the insurance, if the person was insured, there is a financial recourse for the families. I think it's, as far as law enforcement, they, they pretty much found the guy. Most of them wind up dead. Um, the one thing I would, I would say... Right, but so many other people are dead, them, too, that it doesn't... It no, doesn't, no, that's, that's, it doesn't it's survivors. Uh, you have no, to take I, I, care I, of the survivors. And they didn't uh, get to kill the guy. No, no they didn't. But, they, no, but what, want to, they want to have something after that. But what, what I was, what I was going to say, Andy, is, um, you know, when you when you have a bomb, or when you run eighty six people plus over with a truck, uh, that's pretty much an instantaneous thing, isn't it? Uh, not saying there's an upside to not controlling guns a little bit, but you know, that's you know, somebody's going to go attempt to commit a spree killing or a mass killing uh, with a firearm. They have to select a target. They have to aim at that. Well. They have to aim generally in that, and they're not going to hit more than one or two people. I'm not saying any killing is a good thing. I'm not even necessarily implying that you know this should be taken as an idea for or against gun control. It's just something to think about. You know, if I'm going to, if he's going to take shots, he has to take individual shots. He doesn't just press a switch or set a timer, and boom, a hundred people are dead. Yeah, but I don't think that we can necessarily conflate a bomb. With a mass shooting, no, it's a mass. It's a mass killing, killing absolutely. Yeah. But that's also in another class of murderer. But, but they're determined to make it happen. It sure, happens faster. The bomb. Yeah. Well, the bomb takes time, and we have lots of tracking on the materials for making of big bombs, small bombs. No, that that is, if you have the will, the means, and the opportunity. Even, but a lot of people are lazy, bombs. and guns are easier to procure, especially yeah. ammunition for said firearms. Uh, it's the crimes of passion and the stupidity. Those are two things that I'd really like to mitigate the most of. The crimes of passion are hard to do. Just 
coming as a son of a homicide detective, yeah. they will find a way. Um, because I mean, you can take a heavy enough book or as my dad had to work a case, uh, somebody being stabbed to death with a frozen fish. Um, that's they, they will, an interesting story. They will <laughs> find serve the fish. No, no, it was, it was just a fish that was frozen. It, the argument was between the owner of a restaurant and his wife and it went south, but they I will, will not they have will what find he a said. way for the. The, the, the crimes of passion, but I also think with um, in having that extra step can help mitigate some, uh, some crime, not a lot of crime. But even a 10% reduction is worth it to those families. Yeah, we could, we could, you now, know, we well, could just stop. One thing, Good. we won't know unless we're actually able to do the studies. And the studies That's have true. been outlawed too. Yeah. The, the last study was a was a like a meta study, I guess, it was commissioned in 2013 by the Obama administration. It found something like two million defensive gun use type deals in America every year. I, I I'd love to post it for you, but I didn't think to get it up before I. But that's not the but that's not the kind of study that I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah. about more you know more in depth studies on gun the violence in itself. CDC stuff. Yeah. Where yeah, you can go like in owning a firearm. How much does that put your your well being at risk? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. just taking like the stats on uh, male suicide and the, the uses of firearms specifically in male suicide. Um, this is also something where, again, uh, I I think the insurance can can help. I mean, a lot of people may not have life insurance. And this is where having the firearms insur insurance could bridge a gap for those families. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of a lot of mitigating things, but really, if if we could get the studies done, you know, because uh, thanks to the NRA, we aren't allowed to do studies like uh, this. Not, it wasn't just the NRA's fault, guys. Come on, it was it was the people in the CDC who were straight up shilling for the Brady campaign back in the eighties. But yeah. no, well, no, the, no. The the Brady campaign would allow studies. No, no, of course they would. Um, but but it, the studies aren't allowed. The, the it's illegal for the CDC to investigate. Yeah. There's nothing. There's nothing stopping the you know, the private private studies. Is there? There is, and it's money. Michael Bloomberg will pay for it. If you can give him the numbers, he'll pay the money. How, yeah, how, but how many how many groups does he? own or cooperate airs against illegal guns every town for gun safety moms demand action uh, all the astroturf stuff um, he spends a lot of money on gun control he spends a lot of money generally in trying to control people anyway i i loved the, personally the uh the whole thou shalt not have an extra large soda in new york city but that was when he was mayor that was pretty lame that was yeah. extremely lame that's pretty uh, lame. i want yeah. my i want my double gulp okay and you can't tell me i can't have one because i'm an american but, yeah, we like sugar yeah. too. Sugar and yeah, guns. Yeah, we really like sugar. Sugar, yeah, sugar guns, sugar cars. Yeah. yeah. All that. And th stuff. there are there are wealthy people out there who will bankroll it. I don't know why they're not. Now, George yeah, I, Soros I just think, dumped eighteen billion into his foundation. I think there's a reason why they haven't. And given that I don't have mad cash like that, I will okay. probably never know what reason that is. But you know, I'd love to find out. So definitely support us on Patreon a lot. <laughs> 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 It's a great it's problem money. to have, you know. <laughs> too much, yeah. too much money. Yeah, I mean, just just a billion yeah. dollars, one billion yeah. dollar study given to some. Find now, now here's the other thing: find a politically neutral group to take that money, who will take the money regardless of the outcome. Uh, everybody's yeah. and everything is politicized these days. There are a lot of think tanks yeah. that are just designed to prop up numbers. Yeah, um, but uh, but one, one side yeah. or the other like, is going to call that neutral organization. Bias. Bias. Yeah. Whichever <laughs> one comes out with yeah. It doesn't make any difference. It's fake news. And the same thing will happen with government studies. Yep. It'll be pro or con, whatever. It, well, let's get real. It's, it's not going to happen under the Trump administration. But you yeah. know, if, if the Obama administration had been able to get the, the support there, and somehow he, he wasn't. Um, even the first, first two years. Wasn't it the first two years he had a, a majority? Not a super majority, just a regular majority. Yeah, still couldn't get stuff like that through. 
Uh, but that was because they uh, were still dealing with the filibuster because it was a minor majority. And yeah, he's, they hadn't. It was a, they, they introduced the workaround. They did not exploit the workaround as much as the Republicans. They went, oh, we see your workaround. We raise you. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, I personally would love to see Bernie Sanders stand up for 20 hours speaking. Um, that I, I like. I like the old filibuster. You know, I, bet, really I think he stand. has. He's filibustered before. He has yeah, that's done why that. He looks the way he does. <laughs> he's tired. He's tired. He is tired, but he's consistent. He is that. He's okay. very tired. He's been in Jerry's. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I think that we've uh, we've we've gone on and on and on and on and on because so there's so much to talk about. But anyway, oh, no. we ought to wrap this up. So uh, yep. right. uh, there it is. Okay. If you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out, there's a few ways. You can donate to the show through www.patreon.com slash Radio. That's patreon.com slash Radio, And get early access to show content, extras, whatever I can possibly do to make you pay me. Make the algorithm work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. Use your words. Tell somebody about us. And, of course, engage with us directly. Send us messages on the social medias or the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if they're more talkative sort, we've got 470-222-O-R-L-Y. That's 6759. Always ready to take your call or your text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention and crisis resources for you and your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been a really radio part of the Random Acts Company. This work license under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0, United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgea, created by Kevin McLeod of Acomptech.com. And thank you very much, Mr. Joyner. Where can we find you one more time in case somebody has actually listened all the way through the credits? in teradasllc.com there we go okay and you can find all the show notes at our website at com. thanks everybody we'll see you next time bye bye